update. The market's gone crazy. You've heard all the rumors, all the YouTubers, all that stuff. Well, we're going to tell you exactly what's going on right now. Things you need to do if you're thinking about pivoting in this market as a seller or a buyer or even a real estate agent. Let's get going right now. All right, all right, what's up, guys? We were doing our uh, Ron Burgundy kind of like, you know, voice stuff before we went live, and we want to talk a little real estate for you guys. Aaron, how you doing, my friend? What is going on, brother? How you doing? Not bad, not bad. Hanging in there. I mean, it's been a crazy kind of, you know, days, weeks, whatever you want to call it. It's just, uh -huh. it's nuts right now. So, you know, the market is doing what it's doing, and that's all we got. So, um, I don't know. I mean, let's just jump into it. I mean, there's definitely a shift upon us. What have you noticed? Well, you know, as Forrest Gump said, shift happens, right? There and uh, it's it's definitely happening. Um, obviously, the I, I feel like the first shift that, that we kind of experienced was, you know, we, we went from a super low interest rate environment to all of a sudden rates started ticking up. And so there was a shift in basically like buyers saying, holy cow, I got to get in while I still can. So we had that additional rush of, of buyers coming in, which hurt inventory even more. And then all of a sudden, you know, rates shot up to the moon overnight, like totally unexpected, way more than every industry expert, any figurehead pundit, nobody expected rates to get as high as they are, as fast as they have gotten there. And so we, we've seen quite a few things take place since then. And, you know, basically buyers have, some buyers have gotten scared off some buyers have seen this as an opportunity because there's less buyers out there fighting for the for the properties um not all properties but you know there, there's less competition um and then also we've seen a shift with sellers and the the shift with the sellers and this is where like i i feel like there's a lot of confusion and misinformation going on as far as what's going on in the real estate market so we went from with the sellers, we went from a market environment where you could basically, you know, if I sold my house for 700,000, my neighbor, my next door neighbor could just list their house for 750. And there was a good chance they would get it because somebody would come in and pay cash for the difference because there was this huge frenzy of like, hey, we got to buy houses. Like I got to get into a house you know, the whole COVID thing, all, all the stuff that was going on. And so that's ended in terms of me just as a seller being able to ask whatever in the world I want and potentially getting it. Um, and so what we've seen is that over the last like 60 days or so, we've seen price reductions, okay? Now, before you get all excited or, you know, start yelling at me in the comments on this stuff, guys, the, the price reductions should not be confused with depreciation, meaning like the house that you bought isn't worth 50 grand less than you bought six months ago or, or whatever. What we're seeing is basically that whether it was driven by the real estate agent that just maybe, you know, the real estate agent wasn't up to speed on the current market, which which I know you may be thinking, well, why wouldn't a realtor know what's up with the current market? Well, not all realtors are actively doing business all the time. You know, most realtors, believe it or not, they do four, maybe six transactions per year, um, according to National Association of Realtors. So if, if you're only getting in the batter's box once a quarter or, or less, um, it's totally feasible that you could just completely miss the market trend, which was basically not being able to ask anything for your home. And so what we've seen over the last couple of months basically is like a home goes listed for sale and maybe let's just say for argument's sake that it was listed at 750. It really, it was really, it should have been listed for like 699.99 and it'll probably end up selling for like 720 or something. Cause that's like the actual fair market value of, of the home. But, but what we're seeing though, is that because of all these price reductions, tons of people think that the market is crashing. 
Like I, I get blown up like on, on the YouTube videos that I do. I got a lot of people beating me up because I'm telling people that I don't believe that the, the real estate market's gonna crash. I don't care, you know, our, our unemployment would have to get to where we're, we're so far away from that planet that I, I don't even wanna waste the time on this show going into it. But essentially there's, there's so many factors in, at hand that would suggest that prices are gonna actually continue to go up even Dave Ramsey, who Dave Ramsey drives me nuts most of the time because he is ultra conservative when it comes to mortgages and, and real estate. And he wants everybody to basically put 20% down and, and do a 15 year mortgage, which I'm like, who in the world in California or the West Coast or whatever can, can afford, you know, you'll be Dave Ramsey's age by the time you can actually buy a house. But even Ramsey has been putting out multiple series of videos and on his show talking about how the market is not going to crash. In fact, he feels like now is the best time to buy a house because you've got less people competing for it. And basically, it, prices are going to continue to go up. Something that I would say, and I'm going to steal this from somebody because I saw him post it earlier and it's, this is good, is that, you know, you're, you're married to your house, but you're going to date your mortgage. You're, you're, you're not stuck with your mortgage. Obviously, you got to keep making the payment. But what, what we're saying there is that rates change and it's possible that rates are going to drop. In fact, a lot of people, pretty much everybody in my industry thinks that rates are going to drop in the next 12 to 24 months, depending on who you ask. And that's all tied to the, the perception and the assumption that we're going to have a recession. And when we have a recession, our government through the Federal Reserve, they've got to basically go back to stimulating the economy, whereas right now they're, they're doing the reverse of that. And so if you're, if you're not married to your mortgage, but you're married to your house, well, the benefit there is that when you buy your house, the, the purchase price that you paid for, it doesn't change. That's, that's a static thing. It's, you, you paid X amount of bucks for it. Your property taxes are going to be based off of that. Your homeowner's insurance are going to be based off of that. But your real estate or your interest rate on your mortgage, well, if, if you get a loan today, for instance, and the rate's six and a quarter, but a year from now or two years from now, rates drop and you're able to refinance that same house that you're married to and refinance that mortgage that you're dating and, and drop it down into a four or something like that, then, you know, that's going to really change the landscape for affordability. So there's, there's a, definitely a, a group of, of people in our industry that are believers that we're not going to see a crash based off of you know, unemployment, inventory, everybody having to, you know, qualify for their loans, you know, the list goes on of all the things where, if anything, inventory is going to get worse because if the market gets tougher, everybody's just going to hunker down. You know, if, if you've got a fixed mortgage and a bunch of equity, um, worst case scenario, you're going to sell your house. You're not going to go into foreclosure. You're not going to short sell. And if for some odd reason that did happen, one of the things that we have right now that we did not have back in 2007 is all the institutional buyers, all the hedge funds and private equity money. I mean, BlackRock alone, just BlackRock, they bought 4,081 homes last year. That's just BlackRock. So there's a huge, huge appetite on, on the hedge fund private equity level to purchase rental properties as well. And so there's just... There's not a lot of, of things that you can point to without fear mongering around it that you can point to that says, hey, the market's gonna crash. The real estate that you're buying, it's gonna be worth 40% you know, less than what you're buying or, or whatever. I mean, what, what do you feel about that? Because I know that you're getting the same questions that I do about the market crash. What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts there? I don't think we're crashing. Uh, I think we're right now, though. I mean, OK, you're going to hear you're going to get a big sector of the market that's basically going to be like, you know what? I'm not buying. There's too much weird stuff going on and there's too much confusion. And I got half people telling me there's going to crash. Half people telling me to buy. Half people, you know, like everyone's telling me different things. And there's going to be people who are like just don't want to do the research and just don't want to figure it out. They're going to say like 
too confusing. The water's too muddy. I'm not dealing mm-hmm. with this. You know, I'm just not dealing with it. I'm going to Disneyland. Why? We were in the house for like a year straight. We're going to Disneyland. So I think you got that crop of people. Um, but the people we work with more than anything, they're looking for the opportunity. In any market, in any real estate market, there's someone who's going to get rich in every single market. It's just the way life is. Like real estate is always about opportunity and about timing, right? That's what it is. Sure. So you have this big sector of people that are just waiting, you know, like what's the next big pivot, the next big thing in real estate? Where is that opening that you can take advantage of? In our market, personally, my thought is that towards the end of this year, if you save up your cash, you can get some good deals. Um, I do think, I don't think we're gonna get into a crash, but I think there are gonna be openings, pockets, that people can make a lot of money in our market. You know, um, I think specifically rentals. I mean, when you have, you know, interest rates going up, it's gonna push a lot of people into rentals. And so I do think that we're gonna see investments, kind of like people who are like, look, I've been hearing this guy with gray hair, talk on and on and on about Sacramento's real estate market and real rentals. So maybe I'll see what's up with that. But Uh honestly, I got to be honest, like this thing is like, I think that it's not, and I'm not preaching this is a good thing or bad thing or whatever. I'm just kind of like stating the facts. When you start pushing people into rentals and you're the one owning the rentals and there's a limited amount of rentals that for an investor, that makes a whole lot of sense. You know, like rental rates are gonna go up in our area. And for those people who own investment properties, they're gonna be smiling from ear to ear. Are they gonna have to pay, you know, are they gonna have to pay a higher interest rate? Yeah, but if they do it smart enough, you're slick enough, you can still make money from it. And at the same time, rental rates aren't going, if you look at our neighborhood or neck of the woods, rental rates haven't gone down. <laughs> They've consistently either like, eh, gone up, either really high or really like slowly steady, you know? So, you know, you gotta just kind of pick where you're going right now. Like maybe you're someone who's saying, look, you know, my wife and I were saving up and we we were all set to go and we were looking at this million dollar home, but we don't have right now because interest rates went up, you know, we, we don't want to deal with that right now. Well, why don't you buy yourself a nice little rental property and jump on that and then see how that does for you for the next couple of years and see if that's something that you want to jump into. So I think we're shifting into a big investment market, especially in some of these markets that rental business can really do good. And I think, I think it makes sense. And I mean, it's not great for a lot of people who are looking to buy their first home and it, it sucks, you know, for people who are saving their money and their money is going down the drain because of Costco gas prices or gas prices in general because of hyperinflation. It stinks. It's not a good situation for anyone. But again, on the show, we kind of talk facts. And because a lot of the people who were saving their money right now and the higher interest rates were pushing them out, people are going to be moving to rentals more than ever. And if you're in a market that's very ha- like a rental haven like Sacramento, I don't know. It makes sense. I mean, that's at least what I see going on. And I see a lot more investors picking up the phone and giving our team calls and figuring out like off market stuff, seeing some reductions. And I'm telling you something straight up, unless you're in love with the house, wait seven days. It is insane. The amount of reductions on the market. I mean, we've been hovering between 30 to 40% of our market being reduced. So for me, you know, pricing is a big thing right now for me. Pricing is just killing me because, you know, I get calls all the time from people saying, you know, I saw a reduction, let's just jump in. And it's still high or it still isn't the pricing it should be. So just be careful, know the realtor you're working with, make sure they got a good track record. They can gauge the market right. They can figure out if something makes sense. If a house is worth $900,000, it's listed for a million, then it takes a $550,000 price cut and that's a 950 and you buy it, it's still not a good deal. So just make sure you know what you're doing in this market. It's, it's dangerous. It's more dangerous than ever before. Um, now I'm not saying don't buy, but I'm just saying like, do your research. Like I always say, people are, you know, look at Best Buy, look at all these reviews for a TV, but you know, stuff for TVs out there, but stuff for housing and communities and areas and development is out there as well too. Do your due diligence. It's pretty, pretty hefty purchase. You know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> it's not like you're buying a pair of shoes. No. I mean, you know, it's this is for most people, this is the biggest financial decision and the biggest purchase that they'll ever make in their life unless they're buying another house typically. And and you're you're so right in terms of the amount of time people spend shopping for, you know, name whatever unimportant thing you want versus shopping for the house, basically. 
Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's it's been like that for the longest, ever since I've been doing this. I've been doing this almost 20 years now, and, it, you know, it's always been that way. I, I don't know why, um, but, it, you know, it's just kind of human nature, I suppose. I think we just fall in love with the idea of something, and we, like, forget about, you know, all the other particulars to it. And when you're talking about a, you know, a, a piece of property, there's a whole lot going on, you know, beyond just when you buy the house, you know. You, and your, and your mortgage and taxes, you got maintenance, living there, you know, all the different kind of things that ultimately are going to play a role in whether or not you're happy with your decision, essentially. Because you and I have talked about this quite a few times about, so when I bought my house, for instance, that I, I still own and, and live in today, um, however, I'm on Zillow every day looking, and, and one of these days I'm going to make my move up the hill, um, but, uh, you know, the, the, when I bought my house in 2012, okay, we had just gone through the, you know, the, the great recession and we went through the, the largest foreclosure, you know, the, the biggest housing crisis that we've ever had, which is by the way, why everybody's so freaked out now is they think that that's happening again. But I remember in 2012, I had been waiting because every time, you know, for a long time, like from 09 until, you know, like the middle of 2011 or so, there was like 12 months of inventory or more in some areas. I mean, you could look at a house and be like, nah, I, you know, if it hasn't sold in six months, maybe I'll reconsider that one, but I'm going to see what else is out there or whatever. And, and, you know, so that, that was a much different market, obviously. But when I bought my place in 2012, the, the prices kept going up and up and up. And it, when I bought, I was convinced that basically I was buying at the top of the market because we had just seen a huge crash like five years before. And then it had been picking up, picking up, picking up, picking up. And here I am buying in, in 2012, you know, thinking, well, it's possible that I buy this place and it's going to be worth less than, than what I paid for because I just saw this happen in the previous market. And, you know, for me, I was like, all right, do I want to live here? Check. Can I afford the payment? Check. Do I feel good about my employment scenario? Check. All right, well, then what's stopping me from, from doing this? And, and if, you know, if it was anything besides fear, then, you know, I, I don't really have a reason, at least in my opinion, to not do it. You know, I need a place to live, obviously. Um, if I'm not paying a mortgage payment, I'm paying somebody else's mortgage payment. So, you know, and plus they can raise rents. Rents went up 7.4% year over year in Sacramento just this last, this last go around. So it's like, you know, I'm, I'm locking in my monthly payment. And then also I have the, the potential to gain equity and, and build wealth through equity. Well, fast forward 10 years, you know, go by and the house is worth over double what I paid for it. And, and I was convinced that when I bought it, that I was buying at the top of the market and probably going to take a bath on it a little bit. But I was OK, because like I said, I, I wanted to live there. I was OK with the payment. I was, you know, I felt everything was all good. So I, I think that. You know, unless you're buying an investment property, which an investment property is a completely different game versus your primary residence, because we all have to have a place to live. Yep. An investment property, that's an investment. It's all about the numbers. Who cares if you see yourself living there someday or if you like the paint or whatever? None of that matters. It, that's, a, that's an investment, and it's all about the dollar, dollar bills. But on, on your personal residence, well, there's, there's that nostalgia, there's the where do the kids go to school, there's, you know, all those different things that play a role into, like, why we choose to live somewhere. So totally. I, I, I would encourage people to not necessarily, you know, don't get caught up in, in all the fear mongering around this, you know, real estate collapse that's supposed to happen at some point in time, because odds are... And, and I'm not the only one that, that feels this way. Odds are that prices are going to continue to appreciate. The price reductions, though, are people putting the price. They're, they're, they're setting the goalpost way too far down the field. They got to come in a bit. They, they didn't set the price right. It's not that the home isn't worth what it's going to end up selling for. It's just that they, they overshot the moon because they still think that we're in the previous market that we were in. 
Yeah. So it, you know, there's going to be a lot of buyers that are hurt by this because they're going to sit on the sidelines. And the only reason that they're going to sit on the sidelines is out of that fear. It's not because they don't want to live there. They can't afford the payment. They don't feel good about their employment or whatever. It's that they're worried about a collapse or whatever. And so they're going to sit on the sidelines and potentially pay more for that same house a year from now or two years from now or whatever. So I don't know, you, you, you got to kind of, you know, remove the BS out of it and, and really kind of look at, you know, when you're seeing a YouTube video or you're hearing, you know, a couple of dudes like us talk on YouTube about stuff. Well, what's what's their motivation behind things and what's the, you know, especially when it, there's the fear mongering. And, oh, yeah. and I feel like around that it's they're really just trying to get clicks and views, which is, you know, it's it's all about ratings or whatever. Right. Versus like providing actual information that, you know, may not be as exciting as like, holy cow, the sky's falling and the world's going to end tomorrow. Right. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like this guy, he, oh. he comes up, but he's been doing videos for like the last year and a half that have had the same kind of vibe. Like it's like. And honestly, like within the, within the time he's been releasing all these videos about how bad the market is, like I literally have so many clients made so much money during the time he's doing these videos and I'm watching it, but he does the same kind of thing every single week on the videos. It just, it kind of cracks me up. So I just have to show like, I, I will say this though, he's got great thumbnail faces. He's got like, you yeah. know, yeah, I, I love them. This is, this is something that's funny for me though. Like check this out, look at all these de decreases on Redfin. And that's just nuts, man. Look at all this. Yeah. Dude, today was just nuts. Decreased city. Um, here's the thing, and going back to what you were talking a little bit about too, it's like, I would say also nowadays, or now is more than ever, this is the time to work with people you trust. I mean, whether it's Aaron or myself or someone you trust. I mean, what you're gonna notice right now is that like realtors, lenders, title reps, everyone and their mother in this industry for the most part, you know, we've been making, we've been doing good, you know, not, you know, life's been good in real estate. And a lot of people have jumped into real estate. The market, market's getting like, people would say saturated. Man, eh, it is what it is. I mean, it always kind of seems to be a lot of realtors here and there. It's a good line of work. And if you know people and you can get in there and you love what you do, you can definitely make a good living. But what you're gonna notice right now is that a lot of people had great years. Last year, the year before, everyone was doing great. Everyone on Instagram was bragging about closing deals and doing all this stuff and making money. And hey, join my team. Or like, hey, I can coach you to get all these leads. When all these coaching videos pop up, when all these like recruiting videos or how to gain real, you just know the market is going in a bad direction for a lot of these newer agents. So like understand right now, guys, if you're getting those calls during dinner time or whenever, like just be very careful right now. Like right now you're you're dealing with like a, um, a sector of like, you know, realtors and whatever that, that are for the most part, we're making a ton of money like last year, early this year, and they still wanna make that. And so you're gonna get the hardcore press by a lot, a lot of people before you just say, hey, look, I'm gonna sell my house or before you do anything, just check the numbers out, do the research yourself. I mean, just know what you're doing in this market. And I'm not saying don't buy, because I think if you do it smart, and if you do it with patience and you're still a little bit picky about what you're looking for and you know which house to jump in on, the reduction cycle, when things are listed, you know, comps in the area, I think it's still doable, but just don't, don't jump into a lot of this stuff right now. Now you're going to just see a lot of people who are going to be just cannibalizing themselves because, you know, there's not enough deals to go around. So just be careful. The market is going to get really, really crazy right now. You're going to also probably see some like crazy stuff like cruising around, like, like, you know, very creative, let's call it creative, creative financing, right? And you're gonna be like, that doesn't make sense. How is that even like legal? How do you do this? Like, just be careful, guys. Like right now is a time where a lot of big companies who probably grew like crazy, all of a sudden are seeing their deals reduced. In desperate times, people do desperate things. So just be careful out there. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but I'm saying just keep your, just understand that just be very careful out there in this market right now and go with people you trust, who've got good track records, who are doing it full time and people who are already doing good business. So they're not just doing what they need to do to make a, a deal happen. You know what I mean? What do you think of that, Aaron? 
Oh, you, you hit the nail on the head, man. In fact, one of my favorite pastimes right now is going on Facebook, and there's a couple of, of private groups that are only mortgage people. There's, you know, 20, 30,000 people in these groups. And it's, it's hilarious to me. Um, the, the most common posts as of late are, are basically people in my industry asking for advice on like, well, what are you guys going to do for, for money these days? And I'm like, mortgages? What were you doing before rates dropped? Oh, yeah. you were a barista at Starbucks. Or, you know, it's, it's all these people that basically like, our, real estate is, is a cycle, it's cyclical, right? And, and mortgage does the same thing. And in the mortgage industry, you always have purchase business. And the, long, the people that have been in this for a long time, like myself, we, we mainly, we focus on doing purchase loans because there's always people buying houses, but people are not always refinancing. But when rates drop, you'll see that in my industry, that's when like all of a sudden every, every radio station has a mortgage commercial on it, everything, you know, all the marketing companies dust off their, their marketing plan and, you know, it, it, it fires up again. Well, when, when rates drop, that's when people are like, wow, I, I'm going to become a loan officer because I can make a bunch of money doing that. Or I'm going to go become a real estate agent because it's super easy to sell a house right now. When anybody, my, my dog could have sold 30 homes last year if somebody would have just given him the listing. I mean, it really, like getting the actual client is the hardest part of the, of the deal if we're being honest about it. And so... There, there is a lot of folks in our industry, mortgage, real estate, escrow, appraisal, all, all the different ancillary services that are tied to us. And we're seeing everybody, they're coming out with creative, you know, new programs. The funny thing, though, is all the new stuff, it's all old crap that we used five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 or whenever. My favorite as of late is we the some lenders are dusting off the old three two one buy down, and it's basically where the the seller or the builder um, basically will pay for the buyer's interest rate to be bought down the first, second, and third year. And so optically, when you're the buyer, you're looking at it, you're like, "Wow, that's a smoking hot interest rate." But then you're like, oh, wait, that's only for the first 12 months. Then it goes to this. Then it goes to this. And so it's, there's all sorts of little hokey things like that going on where people are trying to basically capture attention so that they can get, you know, that, that little bit of market share that's still out there. But, you know, don't, don't worry. You know, three, four months from now, the, the market, it's going gonna, it's gonna to shake out. And a lot of these folks that, you know, probably should be doing something else for a living, they're going to go find something else to do. And as the consumers, um, you know, you're going to see a lot less confusion, a lot less shiny objects thrown at you as, you know, the, the herd thins out a little bit to a more normalized, you know, supply and demand, if you will, from re real estate professionals to available real estate. But, you know, it's, it's an exciting time to be doing this, man. This is one of those things where, you know, it just keeps your, uh, you know, kind of keeps you sharp and, you know, keeps your, your game face on. But I, I'm, I'm excited about our industry and where it's heading. And, and, you know, it's not like we haven't done this before. This is like the same song, second verse, third dance or whatever. We're just doing it again. Oh, <laughs> you yeah. Know? I mean, here's the thing. I mean, also, if you are like a real turn you're you just got in this and you're kind of freaking out because all of a sudden like you know maybe you joined a team and now the leads are getting like smaller or like you know client stuff like you know now's the time now's the time for all the young realtors or realtors who've been in this business only for a little while to kind of keep it lean don't go into these like crazy like coaching like hey i'll make you a million dollars i'll do that stuff don't spiral out of control like real estate's a great business and it's fantastic you know to be in like understand though that at the end of the day there's no, nothing more than just having the relationships with your clients building that like it's really really simple and there's no like uh, get rich quick thing out there there's no amazing coach who's going to be like oh hey 
now I got you, you know, like a, a million leads and you're, you're making it. I mean, I've got a friend of mine, um, we'll call him Sam, you probably know who it is, and he's on the Tom Ferry Network. He still isn't cashing in on a lot of leads in that network. You know, it's not like they're just going to send you stuff on a silver platter that they can be closing it left and right. The idea for you guys, like for a lot of the people who maybe just closed a few deals, maybe haven't and are in real estate right now, is to just keep it lean and just go to your superpowers. If you're good at Instagram, use that. If you're good at YouTube, go to that. If you're just good at going out and creating events and meeting people and everything, just stick to the basics. Don't drain your war chest on stupid things. And there, you can get a lot of like things out there like Zillow is going to be tempting you, tempting you. Hey, I'll give you the... Don't do it, man. It's just it's just a spiral and you're just going to regret it in the long run. Um, so for all the realtors out there who are struggling or thinking to themselves, this is not going to be great. Honestly, stick to the basics. Real estate at the end of the day isn't this huge, complex, rocket science, brain surgery type thing. It's all about making sure that your book of business and your clients are taken care of right, having a clean reputation and doing right by people. In the long run, that's what will help you weather the storm. So hopefully, hopefully you took my uh, little bit of a words of wisdom out there because like anyone out there can make it. You just got to stick to the basics and understand that there's no get out of jail free card in this one. You got to stick to the basics. It might be a little slower, but if you're good at this and you love what you do, you'll come out the other end of it. You know what I mean? Totally. And and don't send your money to Zillow. God, that's a uh -huh. horrible idea. Donate it to charity or something. Like if if you're just looking to get rid of money, don't don't get rid of it with Zillow because that's what you're doing. <laughs> that's like the worst thing anybody can do. But you're basically giving ammunition to the person who's trying to get rid of you. So like you know, totally. you know why why you know whatever. All right, so let me ask you something, Aaron. I've gotten a lot of calls from a lot of clients talking to me about arms. In in fact, a good friend of mine and realtor, Erica Velasquez, we talked this morning. She was like, "Look, here's a big thing right now. Arms." can still get a person a lower interest rate. And so we had sure. to talk about this, but I wanted the man, the myth, the legend, Aaron, talk to us a little bit about arms versus like fixed rate. What do you, what are you thinking? So this is funny. Cause we were just talking about how, you know, basically lenders are dusting off old, you know, tricks and shiny objects from, from years past up until maybe, I don't know. I feel like it was like December or January, you know, this, this last time around. Um, anybody in my industry that would have suggested to a consumer that they should get an adjustable rate mortgage would have almost like been looked at like criminally. It, it was like, because everybody thinks of the 2007 housing, you know, meltdown that a lot of that was created by people taking out adjustable rate mortgages that they didn't qualify for. Um, but now that uh you know now that rates have come up so much we're actually we're seeing arms a whole lot um we've done several arms for for people this year um and i'll point out that for one the adjustable rate mortgages that you're getting today are not the same adjustable rate mortgages that were being given out in like the early 2000s like the the one percent pick a pay loan where like you make a paint the little payment and they add to your balance, the NAGAM, all that stuff, that doesn't exist. It's, it's just straight up your traditional, it's either fixed generally for five, seven, or 10 years. Now you can get down to three, we even have a six month arm. The shorter the lock period, the better the interest rate is. So what we're seeing is that, especially in the jumbo market, if you're in the conforming market, Arms are still better, but once you get into that jumbo space, the those the FDIC banks, they those are the investors on jumbo loans typically or hedge funds. They really, really want those those uh, adjustable rates on those uh, jumbo loans. But even on your conforming loans, you can get an adjustable loan. And the way that it works essentially is that for let's say if you're doing a five one arm or a five six arm is what you would see advertised. Well, all that means is that. Your loan is fixed, the, the interest rate is fixed for the first five years. Then after that, the loan can adjust either once every month, once every six months, and then there's, the, there's caps on how much the adjustments can be, how, much, how often they can adjust, and, and what's the maximum it can adjust over the life of the loan. But earlier, 
we were talking about how most people think that we're going to have an opportunity to refinance in the next couple of years. Probably the next 12 to 24 months, but who knows. Um, so if, if you're somebody who falls into that camp that believes, yeah, we're going to have a recession at some point here in the you know, future, and when that recession happens, if I look back in time, every recession that we have, interest rates drop because it's just, they got to stimulate the economy when they start doing it. The, the three things that they can do, it, it causes interest rates to drop. So if, if I'm in that camp and I know that I can save 1% or whatever on my interest rate, sometimes even a lot more than that, depending on the scenario, but if I can get a 1% better rate than I would on a 30 year fixed, and my loan is locked for five years or seven or 10, well, if, if I believe that within my, my time period of while my loan is still locked, that I'm gonna have an opportunity to refinance, that's a pretty compelling argument to save money. I mean, basically it's like, the risk essentially is that you're never able to refinance and that at some point your loan adjusts and you're gonna have a higher payment. But that would, that's assuming that you're not gonna be eligible to refinance ever. Okay. So I don't know, for me, like if, if I were taking out a six month arm, eh, that's, you know, I, I, I guess I like to live, you know, life on the edge a little bit. Who knows how, how that'll play out or not. But like a, a, a five year arm or gosh, even a seven or a 10. I, the, the one that we just did in Serrano uh, a month ago, they did a, I think a seven or a, a 10 year arm where we were the guy that bought with us on the golf course. And I'm like seven or 10 years, I mean, that, they may have two opportunities to refinance. I mean, that's a long spread of time in between then and, and now. And so it's like, I feel like the risk that they took to get that lower interest rate is very low. Now, okay. like I said, if it was like a six month or, you know, like you, you had a much shorter time period, then yeah, you're rolling the dice a bit more. Um, but an arm is definitely something that every consumer uh, that can qualify for one should consider. Um, when, when you're uh, looking at how you qualify, it works the same as all the other loans, except they're gonna add 2% to whatever the rate is that you're, you're, you're gonna get. They're gonna make sure that you qualify for a rate 2% higher than that. Okay. Everything else though, as far as underwriting for your loan works exactly the same. So. You know, if, if you are somebody that can qualify for an adjustable rate mortgage, I would definitely take a serious look at that and, and you know, look at your, your timeline, your horizon. I mean, you know, statistically, most people, you know, they don't keep a loan for more than a couple of years. Most people don't even keep a house for more than seven years. So it's like, you know, I mean, if my adjustable rate mortgage is within that time zone, I mean, you're unless you're an enigma, um, you know, your odds are really good that you're going to save money and have an opportunity to, to refi or whatever. And, uh, you know, so I don't know, it's, it's a really popular thing that we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of other products come out. Like you'll, you'll see a lot of people are starting to advertise a 40 year um, amortized loan. It, it really doesn't make that big of a difference though between the 30 and, and the 40 because the longer you borrow, they're gonna make a little adjustment to the rate. The higher the rate, the, the longer you're borrowing for. And so um, it, it will save people a little bit, but you're really stretching that, that timeline out. Um, we're also seeing a lot of people take advantage of, especially uh, these first time buyers who have been kind of locked out of the market due to how competitive it's been. I'm seeing a lot of people take advantage of these like 3% down loans that don't have an income cap. Usually if you do like a Fannie Mae or a Freddie Mac loan and you put less than 3% down, uh, in order to, to qualify, you gotta basically meet the area median income. Like in Sacramento, okay. it's around 82 grand or whatever. So if you made more, then you wouldn't be eligible for a 3% down or whatever. Well, you've got some different programs out through Fannie Mae and then Freddie Mac's got their own where all you gotta do is be a first time buyer and there is no income cap. So we've actually done, like we funded two last week that were 3% down conventional, 
Uh, one, one was a nurse, made like almost 200K a year. Um, I can't remember what the other person did, but they were both way above and beyond the area median income. And these folks probably would have never got their offer accepted six months ago because they were competing against all the cash buyers or conventional buyers that were putting massive down payments. And also, uh, you know, everybody was kind of worried about what are you going to do with the appraisal shortage? Well, now that, you know, appraisal and, and purchase prices are coming in much more in alignment with each other, that's, that's not as much of a concern. So I'm seeing a lot of that too, besides from the adjustable, seeing a lot of like very low down payment uh, scenarios playing out right now. That's cool. That's, that's getting more people into homes. Well, I think creative financing is definitely creative, like smart financing like and here's the thing too like this is what you're going to notice as far as if you're a realtor or you're a mortgage broker or mortgage like it's all about being creative it's all about figuring out like what other people are doing to get their clients in contract and just kind of figuring it out like if you're just going if you're just like with blinders on and you're doing this stuff like it's not going to work in this market you got to be really creative you got to think you know so generic but think outside the box but you really got to be creative about what you do how to do it like you know go from point a to point b how do i get there and you there are options to do it it's just in real estate sometimes you're taught a certain way and you think to yourself oh you know what that's the only way that's the only way i mean mm -hmm. example like youtube right now right like in sacramento no one's really doing youtube um, really that much. And the reason why is because in Sacramento, because it's kind of a little bit like slower, I don't want to say slower, but like less tech friendly market. A lot of the realtors who and made their big business here have been like the ones who get on the phone, call like two hours a day to, you know, there's one group, um, I forget the guy's name, Tom Davies or something like that. He does like a hundred calls a day. Um, like that's the group motto and stuff like this. So it's kind of old school here. For me, I went to YouTube because, you know, it was something that I saw was working for other people in other markets and I applied this to my market. But you gotta be really creative. You have to go at it through other directions and stuff like this to survive in this market. You have to look at outside your market specifically too and figure out where people are doing from do, doing and what they're doing to get their clients in contract like Aaron and Jen they live in these groups they talk to lenders from other areas hey what are you doing how can we apply it to our market that's kind of one of the main reasons why we talk and we we brainstorm on stuff and like you know they'll give me advice on hey you know this is what we're doing here this might work for some of your clients too and it's very important that you have teams like that that aren't trying to upsell you at all I mean right now it's an upsell market you're going to talk to someone they're going to try to sell you something right everyone's feeling like desperate and in need of money it's good to have the groups of people that everyone's trying to help everyone do better and that's you know soapbox i'm off it but just you know be careful out there mm -hmm. all right aaron we got a question yeah and actually bavesh uh first uh you commented on on a video on my channel and i keep telling jen she's got to stop talking over me so i i appreciate you you pointing that out and you're totally right we gotta we gotta work on that a little bit so that uh doesn't doesn't kind of sidetrack the the conversation there so all right let me answer your question so which arm is currently giving better interest rates in the conforming category three five seven or ten year fix uh better versus arm now, although this, this kind of changes, not necessarily on a daily, um, but I feel like every week or so, the appetite that investors have for particular products kind of you know, ebbs and flows. I feel like the investor's appetite for the seven, uh, either the seven one or the seven six, it, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, the seven year arm tends to be the best priced. Now, do you get a slightly better interest rate for the five or the three? Yes, you do. But when you bump up to the 10, the pricing gets to where you're almost like at a 30 year fixed price point. Like it's just, it's, it's not quite there. You get to the seven year and there's a really nice spread between what you would have gotten with the 30 year fixed versus the seven. But when you bump down to the five or even the three, most of the, the comparisons that I've done, although you do save a little bit more with one of those options, I felt like the savings was nominal to the point where it was worth just having the slightly higher payment 
and having a full seven years to get you through to the next refinance opportunity. Um, every scenario is, you know, case by case. And obviously, uh, depending on what lender you're, you're working with, um, it's going to kind of vary on, on what they, you know, what they offer and what they have available. We're a wholesale mortgage broker, so we're not tied to one lender. We work with, we have like over 50 lenders that we have access to. And so we basically shop around to find who's got the best deal, but can also perform and provide good service and all of that stuff. And from what I find, at least right now, and, and as of most recently, I feel like the seven years kind of that sweet spot. Either the, you know, five, if I was not gonna take the seven, I'd probably go with the five, but definitely not the 10 year. And I feel like the three just doesn't give you enough savings to just roll the dice on the three years. Although I, I do kind of think that we're gonna have a recession and uh, refinance opportunities within three years. But what if it takes a little bit longer? Or, you know, that I just, I, I just kind of like having the, I'm a little conservative on things, so I, I, I kind of like having that extra time is all. But uh, definitely check out the arms and weigh that out in your scenario of, of what makes the most sense for you. Because you could save a, a good amount of money. There you go. All right, Aaron, you guys are going live Wednesday, correct? Or are you going to? Yep, yep, we're doing, we're going live. Um, oh, there, Carlos Sanchez popping in. What's up, Carlos? Carlos! God, so okay. uh, enjoying the weekly updates on strategies and options to get into a home while waiting for our house to be built. Hoping the builder gives me enough confidence next month to do a six month rate lock. Yes, that would be that would be great. Let's talk about extended rate locks for a second here. So we've been seeing uh, that's been a shifting landscape as well. And what I mean by that is if you were to go back in time just a, a couple of months ago, every lender on the, under the sun had some sort of extended rate lock that they would offer. And most of them would offer it at no cost or very minimal cost. And then what happened is, is rates shot through the roof unexpectedly. And basically that, you know, when a lender does a long-term hedge, they're totally guessing on what the where the market's going to be when they actually deliver that loan to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or whoever. And that's when the pricing actually matters on the lender side. So if they're giving you, you know, a rate today, but they're not delivering that loan to Fannie for six months from now and rates are significantly higher when they deliver it, then they, they lose a ton of money on that hedge. And so what we've seen over the last couple of months is lenders just took a giant bath on long-term rate locks, basically. And so we've seen all lenders start pivoting in terms of what they offer, uh, what it takes to lock in, meaning like, do you got to pay an upfront fee? Is it refundable? Um, how long can you, can you lock for, et cetera? So um, there still are lenders that are more flexible in their offerings. Um, you know, one of the nice things that you'll, you'll find in our industry is, you know, with supply and demand, certain lenders that are really great lenders, um, but maybe they don't have the, the technology or the latest shiny object or whatever. Well, in order to make up for other shortcomings, they'll have better pricing, or maybe they won't charge that upfront rate lock. So for example, I just locked a, somebody on Friday um, uh, that's, uh, gosh, they're buying in uh, Premier in Rancho. Um, you're, you're, you're working with them, Mark. And uh, we locked on a four month uh, lock for them because they're, they're gonna be closing sometime like mid to, to late October. And we were able to get them locked in with no uh, extended lock fee, no upfront lock fee, um, and still get them, you know, dialed in with a really great interest rate right now. So if you shop around enough, there's still some great opportunities for extended rate locks. With your timeline, you have plenty of time to, uh, you don't have to necessarily work with the fastest lender. Like if you called me up and were like, hey, uh, we need to close in 15 days from now, you know, what, what, what's the scenario here? Well, I'm going to I'm going to broker your loan to a lender that is fast because we got 15 days. 
but you got six months or, or more potentially, right? So with that, that long of a runway, um, you, can, you can basically work with, with any lender. And so what we would be doing when you reach out, Carlos, what we're going to do is we're going to probably go to that same one that I, I locked the other guy to. But we're going to basically find you who's got the best deal for that long-term rate lock and, and work with them because you got enough time to, to work within that. But definitely, if you guys are, are uh, you know, watching and you're um, in the new build space, and you're basically waiting for your builder to let you know that you're close enough to where you can lock or, or you know, that the, they'll even give you a timeline of when the completion date is going to be. Definitely revisit your extended rate lock options because the landscape has changed. Feel yeah, free to reach out with questions too. Yeah, you guys, anything that we go over, either ask your questions here if you feel like it or reach out to us offline. I mean, you know, we're very accessible, all that kind of fun stuff. And um, sure. Carlos, as far as the new home space goes, I think because the new home, the demand is definitely slowed for the new homes. So I, I can't see like one of the main reasons, like, you know, supply chains, all that kind of stuff. But one of the main reasons was because there's so much demand for these new homes that they couldn't build them fast enough. So things have slowed down to kind of a more more res respectable and responsible pace, I guess you can call it. So I can't see that. I haven't been hearing a whole lot about like delays right now. So, you know, so far so good. But as always, we'll keep you informed on what's going on in that space. It's going to be interesting though, but I do see new homes. It's going to be a crazy ride for some of these new home companies too. And it's like, so many buyers out there and like so many people I've been watching on YouTube have like like this vendetta against new homes. They're like, now we can finally take our revenge on the new homes. And I'm like, eh, a little extreme, but you know, I mean, I feel your pain, but at the same time. I feel like, them you know, though. The broker or the, the builders, <laughs> like, let's be honest here. The, the builder game is definitely not designed to, you know, be nice to the consumer, if you want to put it that way. I mean... The, it is designed to squeeze every dime out of the consumer and kind of put them in a, like this, like mental, you know, it, it's a gauntlet almost that you got to go through in order to be eligible to even get my name on a list to maybe get a phone call back. And then maybe I can go stand in line and put a deposit in. And there, there's all these games. And of course, that's all gone out the window. We actually have builders calling our office and we're a mortgage company, by the way, calling our office to let us know that they've got inventory available and that if we have any buyers, they can come on down and get it. So the landscape with the builder market has completely changed. Oh, yeah. I mean, here's the thing, though, and I always tell people this, too. I, I like the sales associates at the builders. Like, you got to understand, oh, yeah. like, a lot of the sales associates are shields for the builder, right? The builder's like, no, we're not reducing prices. We're going to increase. And the sales associate is like, oh man, seriously? Uh. And they go up and they contact their client. Yeah, I know we're gonna increase. They're not happy about it, They, but they have that's their gig. So, you know, they have to deal with it. I call them shields, man. It's like Captain America with that shield, right? That's what the sales associate is. The builder is the one that's like making these, you know, decisions that might not be great, but then they're throwing out the sales associate in the line of fire and just saying like, yeah, hey, tell that to the people. Tell that to the people. The builders just, just that's how it's how it's kind of run. So for me, I never have really anything against the sales associates, except for Lennar, you gotta be more responsible and more communicative. Um, but for the most part, like, you know, sales associates are just, they, they really get a lot, they get beat up a lot, you know? And it's normally not even their call. I mean, truthfully, a lot of the sales associates would more than happy to work with you guys and get it done and, and get oh, yeah. you a house, you know? But like, you know, the builder is that person in the, on the other side who's like, yeah, we're not gonna do it. They just want $1 off. Yeah, not gonna happen. In fact, raise it $3. Oh, come on, what are you doing? And then they flip around, they're like, yeah, you know, um, he re they really love you and they wanna work with you. you know, so it just, it stinks for the sales associates in a lot of these situations. So just, when you're there, just realize that like, you know, they, they're there to do this bidding of the builders and that's pretty much it. And they don't really have too much of a voice past that. So just take it with a grain of salt. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Our, that, that's, a, that's a tough gig to be in. Tough, tough gig. Okay, Aaron, talk to us. Wednesdays, what are you guys talking about this Wednesday? 
So this Wednesday, we're gonna dive deeper into a down payment assistance program that's recently changed. Um, and you know, it kind of caught everybody off guard. So there's, there's a, a really popular down payment assistance program through the California Housing Finance Agency. And you know, it's pretty cool that I'm even talking about down payment assistance because just a couple of months ago, if you were getting down payment assistance, like you had no chance of getting your offer accepted. Well, that, that's completely changed. And so now there's, there's a whole lot of folks taking advantage of this stuff. But the way that it works with those programs is that the agency that provides it, they, they control what the interest rate is, okay? And so last week, for instance, when uh, the Federal Reserve had their meeting uh, that started on Tuesday and ended on Wednesday, and the mortgage interest rate market went berserk between the Friday previous through that Tuesday. And we literally lost like 300 basis points in pricing. I mean, it was a ton. Well, what we saw was overnight, Cal HFA uh, literally, uh, they raised their rates significantly, um, but also they stopped offering some of the down payment assistance. So they have different levels of down payment assistance. And so like, imagine you're in the middle of getting, you know, a loan going, right? You're either pre-approved or you're even in escrow and you just get the thing started. And then all of a sudden the program changes because, you know, the, the agency that, that offers it does their thing. Well, do you still qualify? Can you still afford the payment? All that stuff. So we're going to dive into kind of what, what changes have happened and, and what to, to do about that. What, uh, what are you going to be talking about on your show? Um, we're just going to talk about the changing market, the landscape of Sacramento's real estate market, what little pockets we're seeing as far as um, being areas you can jump in and still kind of do good in the market. Um, we're going to show a little bit more about the reductions that we've been seeing, see little communities that might be worth your look. Um, and also, you know, here's the thing too. There's a lot of people that are thinking that July could be a month that people are back from vacation. They're kind of getting used to the interest rate. They see, you know, reductions happening. They see inventory popping up there and they might be giving the summer market a second wind. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Okay. We got another question. Aaron, based on your experience, what is the next short term trigger point for the mortgage industry? Is it next month CPI data or Fed meeting or something else? Aaron, tell us. So great question. In between now and those two things that you mentioned, the CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index, which the Consumer Price Index report is the Federal Reserve's favorite measure of inflation. And so that report comes out once a month um, and and the feds also are meeting every single month. And so when the feds get together, uh, that's definitely gonna be market moving one way or the other. And the CPI, the CPI comes out right before the fed meeting. So leading into that, when we get that CPI data for the month of June, if inflation has increased over, over May, or if it, if it was above expectations, um, that's not gonna be good for interest rates. Inflation is the enemy of interest rates. Now, if we actually see that inflation is stabilized or is coming down even, even if it's just like a minuscule amount, that'll be good for interest rates. Um, when, believe it or not, when the feds raised uh, the federal funds rate last week by 75 basis points, that actually improved mortgage interest rates. Now, I know that's kind of wacky and everything, but that's actually how it works. The feds don't control mortgage interest rates. They control the rate that they charge banks to borrow money overnight. And that affects credit cards, auto loans, all that stuff. A mortgage is actually a bond if you were to really kind of dumb down, you know, behind the scenes what's going on with that. And so the valuation of those bonds is more closely tied to the 10-year treasury bond. OK, and so if you're watching 10 year treasury yields last week, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the week before leading into the weekend, uh, we were basically we shot up and we were hovering at around 314, 3.14. And in fact, in my video that Friday, I said, man, it really looks like we're heading to three and a quarter potentially. And then next Monday happened and the sky fell. It was the, the uh, fifth worst day in 10 years that we had had. And uh, we actually blew past 335 or something like that. And so in between now and then, 
what will be good or bad for interest rates is this. If there are any other uh, uh, market moving uh, headlines with, um, uh, like for instance, last week, the Swiss bank, uh, they raised their, uh, their rate, their Fed funds rate by 50 basis points. That was the first time they've raised their rate in 25 years. They did it unexpectedly and it caused pricing in the markets to tank. Even after the Federal uh, Reserves, uh, when they raised their rate and I said that it helped bonds, that whole rally that we had Wednesday afternoon of last week completely disappeared overnight because the Swiss, you know, we're in a global economy, so things go 24 hours a day. So we wake up in the morning, we're thinking like, wow, you know, things are going to be pretty good today. And all of a sudden they're worse in the bond market. And we're like, what the heck is going on? So any macro news between the CPI report and the Fed report that indicates that more inflation is coming, um, that's going to be bad for interest rates. So just keep your eye out for basically inflation news um, that is negative. If we start getting some good stuff, where it seems like either our government or other countries are getting a handle on their inflation, then that'll be good for, for rates. All right, Aaron, any parting words? Uh, <laughs> the, the next comment. Uh, you know what? Uh, I, I would just say, you know, don't, don't be scared of this market. There's a lot of opportunities out there, guys. You just got to ask questions and, and vet things out. All right, uh, guys, I'm going to end with this. Just when you think you know the game, they change the rules. So tune in Monday at 530 to find out what your new rules are. Until then, guys, we are out of here.